Hey guys, what's up? It's Evan Ross Katz. I'm senior style editor at Mike. I am joined by an actor, a model, an activist, the winner of America's Next Top Model, the winner of Dancing with the Stars. When it comes to winning, he's doing it. Niall DeMarco, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Of it's course. A thrill. And thank you for being here on your birthday. Happy birthday. Right, I'm working on my birthday. The grind never stops. This isn't work, this is pleasure. <laughs> right, well, what was I thinking? And it is, actually, it is a pleasure to be oh, with you. Oh, thank you. I mean, come on. Um, so I want to start by congratulating you on your Broadway debut in Children of a Lesser God, which you are producing the revival thank of. You. Of course. What has that experience been like for you working on Broadway and engaging with the Broadway community? It's been completely, a completely different experience, like newfound fame. When I first heard about the play that it was going to be revived on Broadway, I knew I wanted to be a part of it because I really believe that accurate representation behind the scenes, not just on stage, is important. And so that that way I can bring my life experience to a de as a deaf person to the stage. So working as a producer um, has been amazing. And I haven't seen anyone else because um, Everybody on stage has been signing. They've all learned how to sign, and so um, it feels like utopia being there. Uh, it's really been an interesting process and a pleasure to work with them. Let's talk about authenticity and representation. Um, we use words like diversity and inclusion more and more these days. How often do you feel like those conversations are actually authentic? You know, I still don't think that we're we're just at that 10% mark of authenticity. I think um, there's a lot still to be done. But every day I see it getting better with awareness and um, it's easy to forget to include people. But if you really want authentic perspectives and experience, then you have to bring in other people. Um, whatever that form is, be it behind the stage, on stage, in interviews, and even in issues related to accessibility, you've got to find those folks uh, those people who have had that life experience so that they can tell you what, what their truth is, right. if that makes sense. You're a big advocate of wanting deaf actors to inhabit deaf roles. How do you feel like Hollywood is doing in regards to this conversation? It's a catch-22 for me because it's amazing to see my language, American Sign Language, on the screen and actors who are he able to hear learning my language. But at the same time, we're still not, it's not 100% accurate. So I think Hollywood really needs to start considering bringing in more deaf talent because there are so many of us who are very talented and can do this work. And if they really want our perspective on the screen, then they need to think about it differently. Right. Let's talk about the diversity within the disabled community. How often do you feel like disability or the conversation around it is tokenized? You know, I hate to say it, but most of the time. Mm. People like to tokenize just to meet expectations. And even sometimes people point at me and ask me for my opinion on disability issues in general, not related to being deaf, um, which is another, that's a different disability that doesn't represent me. So I can't speak on anyone else's behalf. There are 1.2 billion people with disabilities and thousands of different types of disabilities. And so we need to really broaden our spectrum. And I'm more than happy to be there on behalf of people, but I can't speak on others' behalf because I don't have their experience. Right. I want to read a statistic. Uh, the 2016 Annenberg Foundation study found that most characters with disabilities in film are white men and almost none are LGBTQ. Again, looking and questioning Hollywood, do you think Hollywood is doing enough to address this concern? Right. Um, I don't think they're doing enough. But when I first came into the offices and started talking about all of these different ideas, I realized they don't get my experience. Not only mine as a deaf person, but other people of different backgrounds and life's, lives. Um, so they need us. We need to start thinking about writing our own scripts, developing our own shows, bringing our ideas to them. 
because I think that's going to work better because then we can definitely help Hollywood and they need us. I've been into many meetings with casting directors and producers and directors and they always say how much they love me. They always say they love my, what, my work as an actor, but they're not sure whether they can bring in a deaf person or not, which tells me that they don't get my cultural experience. It's like, okay, I'm gonna write my own show and hopefully that will help you. And I'm excited about this because I'm in process with it and I'm excited to see where it's going to go. Do you find like the rejection has gotten less over the years and, and how do you handle that when they say no to you and they put up that barrier of entry for you? Yeah, obviously it's a resentment. Um, it's frustrating. This is not an easy industry to be in and oftentimes it's just like, maybe I'm just gonna go back to grad school and get a degree in education and start teaching. But what I've realized is it takes patience trying to work with them, trying to give them ideas because really they're lost. They don't have any idea what my perspective is and so they need my help, they need us. And really I see change every day in my community with the platform that I have and so um, I, I can't lose this opportunity. I need to, s to continue to change lives and to change the entertainment industry. I've watched a lot of interviews, read a lot of interviews with you, and I don't hear you talk much about your early experiences, so I'm hoping to learn more about your early life. Let's dive in. Great, let's do it. <laughs> yeah, these are questions nobody's asked yet. Yes, so what are some of the early challenges that you faced growing up deaf? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, okay, so let me just give you a little bit of background first. I grew up in Utopia. I'm deaf. I was born to a deaf family. Both of my brothers, my parents, my grandparents, going back four generations are deaf, so my life was perfect. I grew up going to a deaf school, so I never had any problems at all with communication or access or anything like that. So my earliest memory about a challenge would be probably in fifth grade when I told my mom that I wanted to go to the public school and be mainstreamed. Now understand, I was the only deaf kid in this entire school. And my mom thought I was nuts, but she let me do it. And I enjoyed it a lot, I learned a lot, but it was a really lonely time for me because my peers could all hear. They didn't know my language, they didn't learn my language. The teacher didn't understand me well. The interpreter I had who I was getting all my information through wasn't great. And so it was a challenge. And after two weeks, I told my mom that I, was, I quit, I'm done. And she said, nope, you get to stay, kid. And so I did, I finished the year. But then after that, I went back to the deaf school full, full time. But that was my challenge, realizing that I am deaf. And you have to embrace who you are. Right. And you, know, you mentioned that you went to this school, the Maryland School for the Deaf. What was that experience like of meeting other young deaf kids and relating to them? Well, I grew up in a deaf school in New York, and so when I moved to Maryland, it was one of the deaf schools in the country. And it was culture shock for me, because I came in and suddenly all of my peers could sign, the teachers could sign, everybody was fluent. We had a deaf superintendent of the school at that time, and um, the classroom experience was challenging for me because the teacher made it challenging. So I had access to information and education and assignments, and I was able to play on the sports teams. And finally, for the first time, um, I wasn't the only athlete. I was just one of many now. And so I felt like this is where I was able to grow. And the funny thing is that when I went to that public school program, I wasn't allowed to play on the sports team because they thought the deaf kid couldn't do it. They thought that I wasn't going to help them win the basketball game. And when I tried to be a part of after school activities and organizations, they wouldn't let me be a part of that either. So when I went to the Maryland School for the Deaf, suddenly I'm a part of everything and I grew. So definitely an interesting experience. So when did the idea of wanting to act or model first come into play? <clears throat> well, when I was 18, I had a friend who was deaf who's a photographer and was always trying to get me to model for it. But I never wanted to because I was in school, I was in college at the time, and it wasn't my dream. So once I was done with school, I decided to give it a shot. And then next thing I know, America's Next Top Model found me on Instagram and reached out to me. 
And when they told me they wanted to be a part of the show, I thought, you know, maybe I should give it a shot. And the rest is history, as they say. And so I'm really grateful to Tyra Banks for that opportunity. Me too. <laughs> um, for your opportunity. Um, but at that point, were you pursuing education, or what was the idea of what you wanted to pursue for a career? So at that time, I was pursuing a math degree as well as an education degree because I wanted to teach deaf kids math at schools for the deaf. And at the same time, I wanted to instill pride in them and inspire them to dream bigger. And so when Top Model reached out to me, I thought, I have to change my entire career. I mean, this is a brand new path. It's television. It's a whole different world. And so um, I took a huge leap. But now thinking about it, I'm still doing exactly the same thing that I wanted to. I'm educating the public on a larger platform. I've got my own foundation that's bettering the lives of deaf people and inspiring deaf children all over the place. So I'm doing exactly what I wanted to do, if you think about it, which is really interesting. That is interesting. Did you have any hesitation with joining the show? I mean, it's a reality competition show, and we all know some of the tropes of reality television. And also, you were going to be the only deaf person in this competition, working with producers right. and cast members who do not communicate via sign language. Any reservations? Definitely, a lot. So when I first got the DM from Tyra Banks' team, they were saying, uh, you look good. We think you should join the show. And at first I was like, this is a scam. Come on. This can't be real. But then they, they kept reaching out, and it bothered me. And I said, you realize I'm deaf, right? And they didn't know it. And they said, all right, let's have you audition anyway. And so uh, I sent something to them. But there was still hesitation because I'd never watched Top Model at that point. And I felt like, I, I know, right? And I, I wasn't sure if they were really ready for a deaf person or not. And I also felt that even if they put me on the show, there's, that's still a win in and of itself. Mm. I thought, they're never going to let me win this whole thing, so what's the point? But I was really curious about it. So I went ahead and did it. And in hindsight, I'm glad I did. But another thing I didn't realize, that I was going to be language deprived for the next three months. I figured that the other cast members would learn how to sign, that they would include me, that I would just be part of the house. But that's not what happened. And so it was a really, really difficult experience for me. And, and if I could do it again, I probably I wouldn't. I just wouldn't. It was too difficult. Wow. So did they make any efforts to communicate with you? Or what was that period like? I mean, three months is a long time. Three months is long enough for the cast to be at least halfway fluent yeah. in daily communication, because I could have taught them. But they didn't make the effort. And they just didn't care, because they were out to win it. Well, they wanted that 100000 Well, you won it. <laughs> So I want to talk about Dancing with the Stars next, because Dancing with the Stars is a much larger platform in terms of viewership. What I loved about your time on Dancing with the Stars was watching you in rehearsal and getting to see a funnier side of you. Is it ever challenging having to balance wanting to be the fun Nile while also recognizing this giant platform with which you can advocate your message? Definitely. During Dancing with the Stars, I realized how much of a burden that I had. I didn't realize that on Top Model because it was the first show I was on. Um, but suddenly I was like, oh, I have a platform. I have to behave. But at the same time, I want to be me because that's how you win these things, right? So it was a tough balance. And it's, it's hard to explain, but you definitely nailed it. Um, I'm trying to think how I can explain it more clearly. Um, well, and also at that time, I wasn't a, a dancer. I hadn't danced in my life, and so I wanted to contribute to that too, invest in that part of it. And so I worked twice as hard every day, to double the number of hours as the other ones, trying to juggle the, the balance between the actual dancing and being Nile, um, as well as representing the deaf community. So it, there was a lot going on. On that, do you ever feel like there's a seriousness 
seriousness with which people approach you, whether it be in interviews or what have you, sort of, you know, you and I have talked about this, sort of a humorlessness about the way people engage with deaf people. Most of the time during an interview, like let's say either Top Model or Dancing with the Stars, you know, they pull you off and they ask questions. And they always ask, what's hard about being deaf? Did you have struggles in school? Did people bully you? And I'm like, no, my life was perfect. Are you kidding me? I went to a deaf school. I come from a deaf family. I never had barriers. I had access to language. I had access to love, communication. I had everything. And they're like, oh no, being deaf must be so difficult. And I'm like, no, you got me on the show because you wanted to see me cry? Is that why I'm here? Because that's not gonna happen. Um, I had a beautiful life. I had a great time of things. And so that comes up. Yeah. Why do you think there's this expectation, or, or rather, why do you think people approach these interviews so seriously? One big reason I have my foundation is because I wanted to make sure that all deaf children have those same privileges and opportunities that I had. Access to early language and education, and that way they can grow up similarly to how I did. And so with that being said, I think a lot of people that I meet, when they meet deaf people, um, their lives, other deaf people aren't as fortunate as mine. And so maybe that's what it has yeah. to do with. You mentioned the privilege that you have, and, and one of the privileges is this giant platform that you have. But with that comes this, that you are representing an entire very large community. I imagine that's a pretty large burden. And I imagine that makes it difficult to not want to fuck up ever because you're representing this community. Right, exactly. What is that challenge like? Well, so growing up in the deaf community, I was in this little box, I guess, and I have, I've moved out of that. But I've realized that there are a lot of different types of deaf people. For example, some deaf people can talk and don't know American Sign Language. Um, some can't talk and know, and know American Sign Language. Some have cochlear implants or other sorts of aids. And that was tough, trying to figure out how I can speak on everyone's behalf, because obviously I can't. They have different experiences from mine. But I've found my niche, um, and that's what the foundation is. It's, it's about language access, which is the most important thing. Whatever, regardless of what other experiences you have, if you're happy, I'm happy. Um, so yeah. You came out as sexually fluid in 2015. This is a term that many, especially those outside of our community, are not incredibly familiar with. So how do you define sexual fluidity? I really want to know. <laughs> My definition is that I feel like there are days where I'm attracted to somebody and there are days where I'm attracted to somebody else. And it really doesn't matter. Whoever finds my heart is who's going to get to keep it. And I guess that's the definition that I have. Growing up in the deaf community, there are a lot in the younger generation like me never felt like they needed to label themselves because none of us cared. It, we're such a small number and there's so much diversity about it. Um, the only thing that matters is really being deaf and all the other stuff is fine. And so when I started having this platform, people were asking me, so what are you? And I'm like, oh, I have to label myself now and this is weird. And, and so that's what I came up with. And, but that's how I feel about it. Was it challenging having to come out publicly? I imagine that's not something that one anticipates that comes with this fame, and yet people want to know. Yeah, it's a huge challenge. I've advocated a lot for the LGBTQ community, but at the same time, um, I don't want to give my all there because the deaf community is what needs me more. They don't have a spokesperson. Um, or they haven't in a long time. I mean, they've got Marley Matlin and she's still in the public eye, but the LGBTQ community has a lot more people speaking on its behalf. And so while it gets my attention, most of my efforts and, and, and contribution is to the deaf community. And so that's a tough pull to have to balance and, and to manage. And sometimes they overlap. Um, when I first came out, yeah, it was definitely a challenge because I wasn't sure how the community was going to react, but it's been a very positive, very supportive reaction, and I'm really grateful. And I'm glad I'm out, because I feel like 
yeah, I can breathe and I'm grateful for the support I've gotten. And now we can all move on. And we get to see you wearing beautiful fitted tailored suits at the GLAAD Awards. So we also get to benefit from this. <laughs> so <laughs> definitely. So I want to talk about dating while deaf. What are some of the challenges that arise? Well, I always dated deaf people growing up. I've never dated somebody who could hear. But now, uh, with my career, I'm around people who can hear a lot. And so I wouldn't mind dating somebody who could hear. But one tough thing is that um, if they don't know my language, it's like, you know, we can date, but suddenly I'm teaching them a new language while they're also learning about that. And so falling in love and learning a new language, it's really interesting. Um, but I think that's probably the toughest part. How important is it that someone that you date be willing to learn sign language? I imagine that, you know, you mentioned the top model cast three months not even engaging with learning the language. How quickly do you sort of say no to someone when you realize that they have no interest in speaking your language? If on the first date, in the first five minutes, they would say something about not wanting to learn sign language, I'm out the door. <laughs> See ya. Because I don't want to waste my time. I don't want to try and communicate or have to pull in an interpreter with me all the time on a date. No, thanks. Right. My interpreters have a life, too. <laughs> so let's talk for a minute about technology. How has technology and the internet specifically changed or affected your experience? I love that question. So let me make an analogy here. When I was a little kid, or, or let's say before I was born, my parents and grandparents didn't have a lot of technology. In some ways, it was easier being deaf, but it wasn't as easy as it is today. And I'll give you an example. If you wanted to go visit a friend's house and they're deaf, obviously back then there wasn't technology to make a phone call. And so you had to walk or drive over to their house, ring the doorbell, and if they're not home, then you would write a little note and leave it to say that you were there and we'll stop back by tomorrow. And if, they, if you come back tomorrow and they're still not there, it's this, it's this weird dance. But today we would just text somebody. And not only can we text or call or FaceTime or iMessage them, we can also reach out to 911 via texting. I mean, there's so much technology, it feels like it's a lot easier to be deaf now. And with my career, I'm able to communicate with anybody just texting on my phone. And so sometimes I forget that I'm deaf, you know? Right. It's a blessing, the technology is that we have. And let's talk about social media, which is the component of this technology. You know, you got your right. role on Top Model because of social media. Better connect with your fans and also with your advocacy, because I feel like you use social media a lot. Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. I see social media as a way to bring awareness in a quick manner. And I make a lot of funny jokes. Um, People ask me weird questions, and so I use those as opportunities to be funny and, as, um, and to let people say, like, why did they ask you that, rather than me having to say, no, that's a stupid question or something like that. I let my fans take care of it. Um, I enjoy that the most, and I feel like that's the way that I connect most with my fans. Are there stupid questions? Oh, uh, yes, there are a lot of stupid questions, definitely. Sometimes somebody asked me somebody asked me to read the Holy Grail book so that I'd be able to hear again. And I screenshotted it and tweeted it and I said, I don't think it would work on me because I was born deaf, so I can't hear again. So you might find somebody who lost a hearing later in life and maybe reading that would help for them. Um, because the questioner had said again. So I tried to make light of it. Yeah, which is something that you do a lot on Twitter. Um, your clapbacks on Twitter are epic. They're some of my, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I nail them. They're my favorite. How do you sort of decide when to respond to someone? And how do you sort of think up these things? Because they're so entertaining. Honestly, I, I, I don't know how I do it. It's just instinctual. It's like, okay, this one I have to respond to. I can't let this one go. But like, how the thinking actually works, I'm not sure. Um, I feel like I bring such a unique perspective on life because I love being deaf so much that that gives me a, a different thought. Um, 
I don't really know how to explain my thought process, but yeah. Um, there's even a conspiracy theory out there that I'm not actually deaf. People think I can hear and I'm faking it, and I'm like, okay, it's fine. Wow, people have a lot of time. Right? <laughs> yeah. So I want to talk for a minute about ableism. How do you define ableism, and how often in the day-to-day -day do you encounter people with ableist attitudes or ableist behaviors? I've confronted that pretty much on a daily basis. Just little ways, like, um, like for, I'll just give you an example. This is one that comes from my fans. Sorry, fans. <laughs> people will come up to me and speak. And they'll say things like, hey, I'm a big fan of yours. Can you lip read? And luckily, I can lip read a little bit. But if you're my fan, learn sign language. So it's kind of weird. You want to talk to me, learn my language. Um, during work, yeah, a lot of times, people make decisions without me being a part of it, without even asking. And um, like, let's say at a photo shoot. They make decisions about what they want to do and everything, but they have forgotten about me, and I'm the model, and so I should be the lead in this, or at least have a say in it. So it's that type of ableist thinking that um, I don't, because I don't communicate in their language, they make decisions without consulting me. Let's talk about the fashion industry, for which you and I are both a part. Um, I want to start with some numbers. There are 70 million deaf people worldwide, according to the World Federation of the Deaf. Over 1 billion people worldwide with some form of disability, according to the World Bank. And according to the business of fashion, the disabled community has a spending power of more than $1 trillion. So it seems like there's a lot of opportunities for the fashion industry to engage with the disabled community. And yet, do you think that this industry, our industry, is doing enough to engage with the disabled community? I don't think they're doing enough. I think they're scared. Obviously, they want things to sell, right? But I think they forget that disability groups are the largest minority. It's like 1.2 billion people in the world or something. And so they need to realize, well, they need to be bold and bring in people with disabilities. And I guarantee you that they would get support. There would be a groundswell um, if we got those two communities together. And I don't think that they haven't tried that yet. Like, for example, I'm a model. I'm part of the fashion industry. But I still have that problem. There are big campaigns out there who are afraid to hire me because I'm deaf, no matter how I reassure them. And so it seems like it's a work in progress. And I'm not really sure how we can solve this problem. What about your experience in the beginning of your modeling days until now? Do you see there being granular progress? Yeah, definitely. I remember the beginning days of my modeling career. I was working with photographers who I would meet, and it was often the deer in headlights response. But I always make an effort. I text, communicate with them via my phone, gesture. And they would always realize how easy it was. And they would say things like, oh, that wasn't that hard. And I'm like, no, it's not that hard. But at this point in my career, photographers that I work with, it really goes smoothly because I think there is more awareness out there. And I've already proven myself. And so they know what they're doing. They know that I know what I'm doing. And it just works. Absolutely. In a recent Business of Fashion podcast, disabled activist Sinead Burke talked about the importance of empathy versus sympathy and how empathy is what really creates real understanding. I'm wondering what your take on that is. It's interesting. I probably have a bit of a different perspective on this. I think that if a business really invests and let us make decisions for ourselves about like the types of campaigns that we want to be a part of and what they should be, because we've got the authentic perspective. Like, for example, I'm deaf. And from my perspective, I know what makes great TV. So I probably know what's going to make a great campaign. And so for me, that's considered, I consider that to be part of empathy. Sympathy would be bringing somebody in to work with me in a tokenized way, somebody with a disability. 
versus bringing in my entire world to their campaign, which makes it authentic and will actually help it to sell better. So it's a two-way street. Yeah. I want to talk about the LGBTQ community in regards to the disabled community. The differences between a cisgender white male and a trans woman of color are vastly different. I expect that this is similar for the disabled community. How often do you feel like when we talk about the disabled community, we're not accounting for the disparity? This is a hard one to answer. So I want to make sure that I, the question is about bringing in all sorts of different disabilities together, right? Right. I feel like so often when we talk about the community, um, there are many people of many different experiences, and I think oftentimes people tend to think about just certain sets. Right. Definitely. The word disability is a really generalized word. And I think people need to realize that it's not specific to any one, <clears throat> one group or people. And oftentimes, disability means something that you can see. But mine is an invisible disability. So if I'm walking down the street, nobody knows I'm deaf until they interact with me. They think I'm able-bodied and, and just can hear whatever's happening around me. But there are a lot of people with disabilities who have invisible disabilities. And so that's what I'm trying to educate people about, that there's a lot more to it than just what you can see. And at the same time, if we're talking about deaf people being included in the disability community, the difference is that we have different needs from the rest of the community because we have our own language that's different from spoken English. So it's, it's hard to explain. So if I had a Venn diagram, it would make it a lot easier <clears throat> because yes, Deaf people are part of the disability community, but we have different needs because we have language rights. We have rights to access for education and things like that, with, which the rest of the disability community doesn't have to engage with. I want to end. There's oh, go a ahead. a lot there. Yeah. Uh, a lot of moving parts in that question. <laughs> so I want to end by talking about a tweet of yours from a few weeks ago. You dinged Mike because we wrote an article about diversity in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. <laughs> Noting, you noted that disability is also part of diversity. You said, Hawkeye is actually deaf and Marvel made the character hearing. How often do you feel like disability is discluded from conversations around diversity? <laughs> well, first of all, uh, I'm glad I dinged you because that got me an interview, right? <laughs> yeah. No, I would have had you either way. Great. Well, yeah, so many times people forget the disability conversation in diversity. They think diversity has to do with race, gender, but there's so much more to it. We are part of diversity as people with disabilities. And the danger is that we get excluded. And so I want th that to be a part of the conversation. In the comics, Hawkeye, and I, I don't remember there are a couple of issues where specifically Hawkeye is deaf. And so they brought in an actor who can hear instead. And so how do I say it? I, I think it would have made a better movie and, and better TV if they'd actually brought in a deaf person to play a deaf Hawkeye. And I mean, no offense. Um, Hawkeye in the Avengers is boring. <laughs> a lot of people don't even like him. I'm sorry. I'm a big fan of his work. but. Let's have a deaf actor in there instead. Why not? I agree. Would you consider playing the role if you were asked? If they asked me, I would absolutely consider it. OK. Um, I'd probably have to dye my hair a lighter color, but yeah, I'm in. That's easy. Um, before I let you go, we have a little surprise for you. As we mentioned, it is your birthday. So we have a little cake for you on your birthday. Awesome. Um, I want to thank you so much for joining us. We're going to sign out now because we are going to devour this cake. But Niall, thank you so much for joining us, for educating us, and thank you for all the work you do for, the, for many communities. Well, thank you for having me. It's been, you've asked a lot of great and tough questions, but I feel good about it. Thanks. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, guys.